Science and Technology, Government of India. EDC conducts various programs to foster the entrepreneurial spirit amongst the technically qualified graduates and postgraduates from faculties of science, engineering, technology, and pharmacy. The CEL has organized five on-campus and off-campus programs to promote entrepreneurship as carry choice for graduates and also faculty. A total of 502 participants from various streams of science, engineering, technology, and management participated in these programs. The university is shortlisted for the establishment of technology business incubator under DSP Nidhi scheme with financial assistance of Rs. 6.7 crores. The campus placements are very encouraging in all branches of engineering in UG, PG, and IDP programs. 721 students of JE to Hyderabad constant colleges and units were placed so far during the campus interviews in the current academic year. Highest package offered is Rs. 35 lakhs by Microsoft with average being over rupees 4 lakhs. The cell also conducted job fairs in all the districts of Telangana state. Many students from constant and affiliated colleges of the university were selected by various companies through campus placements. The companies that offered placements include Microsoft, and constant and affiliated colleges won prizes at various symposia conducted at national and international levels, besides faring extremely well in GATE, CAT, GRE, and other competitive examinations. To conclude, as stated by Benjamin Franklin, quote, without continual growth and progress, such words as improvement, achievement, and success have no meaning. J2 Hyderabad has dedicated itself to foster academic excellence. The period under review was quite successful and gratifying. It provided us the necessary tools and knowledge to identify our own potential as well as responsibilities. The high rate of obsolescence coupled with the increasing cost of modernization has prompted us to use our resources with care and prudence. I am happy to inform you that the to Hyderabad has not come across any incidents of indiscipline or unrest during the last academic year. Not even a single day of academic schedule has been lost or disturbed. Given the encouragement, understanding and cooperation from all sections of staff and students of the constituent and affiliated colleges of the university, I hope to take this university still further on the path of quality education. Chancellor, sir, I thank you for extending your support and advice from time to time. I wholeheartedly thank Dr. Uday Vijayasai, Director IIT Hyderabad, for accepting to be the Chief Director. Chief Guest of this afternoon's JNQH Hyderabad 8th Convocation, respected Professor Dr. U.B. Desai, respected Vice Chancellor of the University, Professor A. Venubapal Reddigaru, distinguished members of the Executive Council and Academic Senate, distinguished members of the faculty, do donors of endowments, gold medals, recipients of degrees, gold medals, and the proud parents, gracious ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I would like to say that I deem this a great privilege to be in the midst of this August audience. And I would like to congratulate all the winners of gold medals, the various degrees, and the doctorates who have worked hard to get this thing today. Normally, I always felt that the chief guest at any convocation should be one who will act as a role model for the students. And I'm indeed extremely happy today that Professor Desai has consented to our request to be in our midst today. Sir, in giving you this honoris causa, the university has privileged itself. It is not an honor cost on you, but an honor cost on this university that to give it to such a distinguished son of India like you. Sir, you have been a recipient of various awards all over the world, internationally. And as said in the Gita, Patram Pushpam Palam Toyam. See, what we may leave to God, a small offering, God says, in whatever form you may give it to me. You may give it to me in the form of a leaf, a flower, or just water, but I will accept it because the heart which gives is more important. And so please take this honorable kasa, sir, with the heart of which we are giving it to you, and not as an award to you, because you have already got various awards all over the world. Sir, Aap Jai say, Kai out distinguished scientists, is desh mein budai ho, dehi amari prathna hai. Well, students, you have heard an illuminating lecture of Professor Yubi Desai, because he in his capacity as director of the IIT, 
is capable of doing it. But I will speak to you more as a journalist and as a layman who has neither technical technology at his, at his uh, uh, end or knowledge. Neither of this. I am Narsimha. Neither technology nor knowledge is at my disposal. And so you'll have to pardon me for the speech that I'm going to make. Well, today, students, start your journey of lab to land transfer. We, all, we often hear this word, lab to land transfer. And this is what is happening to you today. Again, to head to the land, to really sort of prove what you have learned in the land. And let me tell you, learning is a continuous process throughout life. It is, does not end at the university level. Today I find a worthy colleague of mine, Mr. Jitender, in my presence today, who has probably got a PhD. It's really, why can't we produce this in our country? This is a challenge to you youth today. But let us produce these gadgets in our country and make healthcare affordable to all of us. Affordable to the, health, to the common man. Because the normal excuse given is that these gadgets are very expensive and they are imported. Why should we import these gadgets? With so many of you here, with such a huge knowledge bank available here, I think we should work towards sort of providing these gadgets, these instruments at home so that we are able to make healthcare more affordable. And the field of healthcare also, now there are various other things which, for example, the treatment of cancer, we got now things from, uh, which will probably point to the exact spot and not hurt the, uh, the surrounding tissues or surrounding cells. So I think we need to go on developing technology as a facilitator for healthcare and as, a, as an expense reducer of healthcare. That's the challenge that I would like to throw before this audience, uh, August audience. Energy security. Today again, thermal energy or hydro energy is not going to last forever. We need to look at substitutes, non-conventional energy. The sun is available to us in plenty. We are looking at solar energy. Yes, solar energy to start was an expensive proposition and the size of solar panels was very large. Today we are going to micro panels. We need to sort of see how we can still go to micro panels. For example, if you are able to sort of substitute this thermal energy and hydro energy with solar energy, I think our costs of power will come down and it can even be used for agricultural operations. It will increase our agriculture, it will improve our agricultural operations of a pumping, etc. So energy security is at another field where I would like you to sort of see how we can provide other non-conventional energy sources. Food security. Again, in the field of agriculture, we need to see how we can bring in newer technologies. We have not had a seed revolution, we have had one green revolution. After that, we have not had any revolution. We have only had evolution. I think this is a time when you people have to see how can we increase food output. You will appreciate the land area is diminishing by the day because the industrial development has to go on if the economy has to move forward. So with the diminishing land, unfavorable monsoons, undependable power supply, how do we increase our crop produce to feed the one billion plus population which is only increasing by the day? This is a challenge. How do I use technology for sort of enhancing our food security and ensuring that everybody is able to get his food in time? Then comes environmental security. Pollution is something which is beating us all over the place. How do we really prevent pollution from spreading in this country? How do we discipline people? How do we ensure that industries are made pollution compliant anti and they sort of have anti-pollution measures? The, pro the normal thing that is given to us that they have anti-pollution measures there, but these are measures which can be switched off and switched on. When the anti-pollution authorities go to check, they find the machine is on, but later on it is off. So there must be something which will be a continuous machine which is kept in these industries so that the pollution is taken care of and we need to sort of protect our environment and this is going to be a terrible challenge for you. Then comes, of course, national security. The next decade is going to be one of cyber terrorism. Nothing else. We are not going to fight wars on land because it's very expensive both in terms of man and material and costs are very prohibitive. So for, therefore the fight is going to be on the cyber space. How are we going to fight cyber terrorism? This is a challenge. I mean, everybody talks of cyber terrorism. Courses are introduced in cyber terrorism. I mean, my multiple, multiple colleges have started something on cyber terrorism. The same thing is going on cyber terrorism. But when the reality hits you, <coughs> we must know how, how are we going to react. This is the challenge that next decade is going to face, and India is one of those which will be the major target of cyber terrorism. Because given the fact that everything is wired, Except in the human being, every, every single inch we are wired today. Your banking systems are wired, your, your communication equipments are wired, your, your defense equipments are wired, your national security is wired. So if you are not able to fight cyber terrorism, we are going to be in this. So I would like to ask the August audience, please contribute towards cyber terrorism and see how exactly we can take it forward. And then coming to artificial intelligence, an extremely useful facilitator. 
No question about it. Also, this has also explained to us how artificial intelligence can really sort of enhance, improve life. But artificial intelligence is artificial. We must accept it. There can be no substitute for the human brain. Today, I'm sorry again, I'm saying it as a layman, and Mr. Professor Desam will pardon me for this layman's expression. Sir, one gets a feeling that technology is being used as a substitute for human memory. I'm afraid I'm one of those who are opposed to technology as a substitute. Technology can be a facilitator, can be an add-on facility <coughs> to sort of enhance the utilization of a particular facility. But if that is being used as a substitute for the human brain, I'm afraid we are going to have more of dementia patients in this country very soon. I would appeal to the youth, please do not use it as a substitute. Use it as a facilitator, use it as an add-on. Today you find people who are walking on the streets, I mean, they have no time even to look at the beauty of, beauty of nature. Everybody's there talking on the phone. What is this all about? What is this, what is this infatuation? What is this great commitment that you have to your mobile? I mean, today you'll find nobody can live without a mobile. All the time you keep doing it, you go to talk to anybody, that's always only sort of putting his thing on the mobile. This has almost become an infatuation. This has become a sickness. I think technology sickness, I think we need to overcome. Technology should be used for the purpose for which it is intended, and not for this purpose. It's slavery to technology, for the, as a substitute for human behavior, I think is actually not acceptable to me. I'm sorry, Professor Desai, I'm making this comment because I see this happening every day. You go to you, people come for a meeting, they are more and more playing on the mobile. What is this all about? You go to you go to visit visit somebody at home. He's not looking at you. He's looking at his mobile and talking to you. You go to the roads. On the road, people are walking. They can't appreciate nature. You are driving. You are doing this. I think this complete. Technology dependence, as I would call it, or technology slavery, is something we need to fight against. Technology is a must for our life, to make life more comfortable, to make life, give, make it as a facilitator, make it as an add-on, make it as a spinner. Yes, completely I am with technology. I am for technology. I am a great lover of technology, but not as a substitute. Because this is really affecting our societal behavior. It is affecting human norms. Our human behavior, our human relationship is suffering. You send somebody a message on mobile, <coughs> he doesn't even have the time to say thank you. He sends you a funny image. And I, I mean, it has come to this stage of human behavior. You see how human behavior is getting disrupted. And this is actually because mobile is becoming a disruptive technology for me rather than a, a facilitator. <coughs> Nobody has the word to say thank you to send him a nice message on his either anniversary or a birthday, wishing him. He doesn't send you a thank you card. He needs to put some image, funny looking image, and many times I send it back saying, I don't understand what is the image. Because as Professor Desai said, there's a, there's, there's a divide between the generation X, EX, and generation X, alphabet X. And I belong to generation EX. I don't understand it. So please, this divide, I think we need to really break. How do we go about it? That is a challenge which I would like to give to you. And it also requires the students of the various college, affiliated college in the JNT, apart from the various jobs, good jobs that you're doing here, please try and take on some social work also. Please organize things like blood donation camps, go in for cleanliness camps, you know, around some villages around, try and teach them some hygiene, try and do some elementary learning to those villages, to the rural folk. <coughs> I think you must contribute to society at large, the outside world also, because you are all very, very learned people. Try and go into the rural areas, from the villages that join here, adopt a few villages. Why can't this university and the affiliated colleges, each one of you adopt even one village? I know you have a whole lot of affiliated colleges. Even if you can adopt one village and make it a total village in terms of health security, energy security, knowledge security, cleanliness, everything, skill development, teach them. Teach them normal skills, which always they can make an earning. And that will be your contribution to society. Well, you will certainly, after graduating today, you will contribute much more. <coughs> but even as students, I think you have a great contribution to make to society. I will appeal to all of you that you should adopt some villages and really try and do this. That will be an ex of extreme use for you. And as I told you, please use technology as a facilitator. And try and teach people how to use it as a facilitator and not as a substitute. Let it not affect our human relations. Let it not affect our societal relations. And technology, I feel, again I will emphasize, should be of societal relevance. 
In fact, in the next annual report, I request the Vice Chancellor to tell us what are all the newer technologies that have emerged from the JNTH of societal relevance. I was just complimenting Professor Desai that at the IIT convocation that we attended last year, he gave us a very whole range of technologies the students have developed. <coughs> because we all use these fancy technological terms, T hub. You know, it's all very, these nomenclatures, again, it's a very, very difficult thing for a layman like me to understand. I remember the days when I started working with Dr. Abdul Kalam when he was a scientific advisor to the government. I went and told him, and saying, sir, I do not know the spelling of technology. Please don't give me high technical terms. Start teaching me from basic. And the man would take a blackboard and with a chalk write out simple, simple language and say, this is how technology is all about. I think instead of putting these jargons and everything, I think we should really say, I think every year the JNT will come out and publicize in its convocation, <coughs> saying what are all the technologies of societal relevance which have been developed by the students, not just at the lab, but how has it been transferred to the lab. This lab to lab transfer of technologies from the JNT is something I'm looking forward to, because this is a university for which I have the greatest of regard. This is one of the finest universities that we have in the state. It's a real knowledge bank. This is a university which has the last voice has mentioned, has not had any case of indiscipline actually. I hope you'll continue to maintain it. Students, because your parents are investing a huge money on you, please remember that. Please do not fritter away that amount of money, the hard work of your parents are putting today. And my last request to you is, please remember your alma mater, your institution from where you have passed out. You may become something very big tomorrow. I'm sure all of you have become very, very big. You'll probably have been in the internet sphere. But remember your acharya the man who taught you, the institution from which you passed out. This Acharya Devo Bhava, I think that is our fundamental heritage. Remember that. Never forget your teachers, because they have, they are, if what you are tomorrow, it is because of your teachers, not because of you. Do not have this illusion that you are a great man, that you are a great technologist, and you can do this. It is because the seeds have been sown by your Acharyas, by your faculty members of this great institution. Remember that with gratitude. Remember, have this sense of gratitude to your institution and to your teachers, to your professors. <coughs> they may be somewhere, but always remember them. And feel proud, and you must do something which the institution feels proud of you, the teacher feels proud of you and says, here is my student. I mean, nothing gives greater satisfaction to a teacher. It is not his salary, it is not the recognition, <coughs> but the fact that he's able to look at someone and say, he was my student. But the, the thrill that a teacher gets when he says, he's my student, is something to be seen to be believed. Let me tell you. Students, that I think is the most important element. And finally, feel proud of India as a nation. We don't have to look to the Western world, we don't have to look to the outside world to learn what's already available in our own heritage. We have a very rich heritage, there's nothing that's not available in this, in this country's heritage. It's only ignorance. Absence of evidence is taken as evidence of absence. That's the problem. I think we need to go back to our old days and you'll find many technologies, many good things are already available in this world and more than anything else, ethics and morality. In your quest for good earnings, I'm sure all of you will earn a very heavy packet. I mean, like just now, I also mentioned that the, the pay received by somebody was probably four lakhs, which I don't think we have ever seen in our own life. At least I have not seen it in my 60 years of life as a professional. Yes, that is the great. You are earning a lot. But please remember, ethics and morality is ultimate the foundation of a society. The foundation of your, your, your recognition will be based on ethics and morality. Remember that, and you will all do very well. May God bless you with all success, and I thank you all for giving me this place. Thank you very much. God bless. Thank you.